You're just in time for your weekly most comprehensive look at the world of business and economics. Tonight we are focusing on capital markets and we are privileged to have the Chief Executive Officer of the Nairobi Securities Exchange, Jeff Odundo. Welcome on set. Thank you. Congratulations on your numbers for FY20. Uh, quite impressive considering the operating environment. The question is, if you disaggregate the numbers, you can see, clearly see it was largely a uh, cost rationalization, lifting the heavy gear on that side, because the top line is not as strong as the bottom line looks. How far can cost rationalization take the exchange forward? So um, back in 2019, towards the end of 2019, uh, the board embarked on a very uh, aggressive cost management strategy. And it was out of the realization that uh, the, end, the exchange has a high level of vulnerability to what goes on in the markets. Uh, we are very correlated to the um, performance of the equity market, highly correlated. In fact, I think at that time, we were almost 80% of our revenue was coming from the stock market, the equity market itself. And so given that level of vulnerability, I think um, we, we sat down and said, uh, what can we control? Because we can't control the trading volat movement in the market, but what can we control? So we said that what you can control is costs. And so the journey towards cost management began in 2019 when we did a full organization restructuring and uh, were able then to really uh, scale down some of the uh, positions that we felt uh, do not necessarily need tall structures. Uh, and we, we brought those and flattened them down and uh, went nationwide, I mean, um, company wide to really try and uh, ensure that we were getting optimum output of the resources that we had. So we had a restructuring, um, and so we had some exits in 2019. Uh, in 2020, we also just reorganized the business a bit and looked at other operational cost areas that we could save. And so that was out of just an, uh, our view on the business and taking into account that we had almost uh, began a very good journey toward automation, and hence uh, <clears throat> we were able to leverage on technology on some areas uh, that, what, that were previously being manned by our human resource complement. So we didn't necessarily need to have a huge staff base. So that was really a well-informed decision, not a reaction. Uh, come 2020, first half, quarter of the year, we had a good run, uh, but again, the movement to the virtual trading and virtual operational, again, that led us to really save uh, substantially on costs as well. Um, our, some of our events could not happen. Um, we had certain corporate action events like AGMs and all that. So if you aggregate all those costs, uh, it led to what uh, was substantially um, a decline in our costs by about uh, 35%. And so uh, we are really at a point where we feel the organization is now at the very right fit. Uh, of course, we'll continue to have cost improvements, areas that we think we can save. We're also leveraging on partnerships. So some things before we would do ourselves, like training, but now training we're doing using a relationship with other, other institutions, other providers, and that helps us to, to, to save on costs, including the fact that we've now gone fully digital on training, almost fully digital. Our data business sales would have to travel to Europe to go and sell our data to international vendors. We've also partnered with an agent internationally. So there's always going to be areas that we need to look at and how do we evaluate ourselves and make sure we improve. That notwithstanding, driving top line is our goal. So we are going to remain very focused on that. But uh, cost, um, I think, is, is, is really something that we need to be conscious about. We pay a very good, strong attention to our cost income ratio and cost um, uh, our effectiveness as well, just to ensure that uh, we manage that going forward. So it's not a, a reaction. It's not a short-term measure. It will continuously be part of our agenda as we run our business. And you've clearly pointed to my next question because you're saying um, – um, right-sizing, if I could call it, your cost-to-income ratio is a key agenda. I think I remember reading that the target is about 65%. Do you feel you're on course for that? Well, we're on course for that. In fact, um, last year we did uh, 69%. Uh, this year we're budgeting to actually drive it to 61%. Um, last year, the reason why we, it went to 69 is because our revenues uh, declined by 3%. Um, we've taken a view that uh, this year we're going to be very uh, strong on revenue performance. Uh, however, the year has begun as it is, and now we are back to um, the situation we were in the first quarter of last year. Uh, our only hope is that the vaccine um, uptake and also the, the measures we're taking now as, as, as a country will be more longer term so that we can sustain performance. Uh, what gives me a ray of hope is our international investors. Um, 
the what's happening globally on the vaccine um, distribution and, and, and administration is actually good. And that's likely to see a, back, a very high inflow of foreign investors coming through. So uh, I'm pretty, fairly optimistic that the year is going to open up better. Um, my only concern is to really see how long this um, these measures that have been put in place will take uh, because we'd not like them to really spiral for long. Otherwise, they'll, have, they'll probably pull us back a bit. Yeah, but um, yeah, cost, we, we believe we can achieve the cost income ratio. Where we are on cost is really, I would say, optimized. So we'll probably not go any further there. And now probably just drive revenue to, to have the cost income ratio where we want it to be. One of the areas looking at your numbers that suffered significant cost attrition was product development. And if I'm looking in as a shareholder, then my issue becomes, is this a trade-off whereby the strong value proposition for NSC over the recent past has been product development. You put out derivatives, you put out rates, and many other products. Now, if you're cutting on costs on that side, yet this has been your strong footing, where does that leave your, your offering? When we, when we came up with our strategy 2015-2019, product development was one of our, was our biggest um, objectives. Now, the journey to build all these products began way back, 2015-2016, and so we've done, we're in full completion in terms of the development of those products. If you look at the REITs market, it was launched in 2015, the ETF in 2016, derivatives in 2019, uh, USP in 2020, all that is done. So there's no more uh, capital going to develop platforms, uh, structures, um, getting research done, all that is in place, it's been factored in, we're good to go. So we don't have any more uh, capital uh, which is going to be used to develop products. We're now focusing more on education and uptake. And how we're going to achieve education and, and faster uptake is through partnerships. So we don't necessarily have to um, allocate more capital towards these products. It's just about now going out, communicating um, very, very aggressively. So there's, the budget is, is basically on those two areas, so not much um, uh, capital being allocated to that area. So with that in place, um, I, I must say, uh, at least we have done well in terms of ensuring products were way, way ready before all this impact that we're seeing happening. And so we don't have, a, have to go through that journey again. So we are, we are for, sort of comfortable that uh, we've got the right trajectory. And using partnerships and uh, relationships that we have, we'll be able to also manage the cost of rolling this out. One of the light line items that gave you a significant tailwind in the latest results you've given is uh, other comprehensive laws, which had a significant decline compared to 2019. Could you please speak a little more to this issue? So back in 20, 20, 2017, uh, we took a position in the Dar es Salaam Stock Exchange. Uh, Dar es Salaam uh, Stock Exchange was doing an IPO, and it's always been part of our regional strategy to invest in related businesses. And so we invested in the DSE during the IPO. Um, we, however, were able to make an exit because we got some profit. Uh, but again, the board reconsidered this position and felt that we should have taken a strategic position. In other words, a bit more longer term. And so we went back and um, took a bigger stake, almost 4.9%. Our intention was to get to 10%, but uh, owing to restriction on investor, external investors, we were capped at 5 So we had 4.9%. Um, however, the, the share price has declined. Um, Quite a, quite, a, quite a lot and uh, uh, owing to probably the issues on COVID and, 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 and also certain ma market structures and market issues in, the, in that country. And so that, co that was actually the, uh, the largest component of the comprehensive loss that, that came through our, our p in uh, 2020. So it was just the DSC holdings that we have. I see. Right. And uh, now speaking about the strategic position taken in the DSC, do you see um, cross-listing as a viable uh, proposition on that side? Well, cross-listing across the region, cross-listing across the world is really our, one of our key drivers, our key, our key goals. Uh, just to speak to that, um, in 2018, we were able to cross-list, uh, no, 2019, the Bank of Kigali. And today, we trade more volume of Bank of Kigali here than the Rwanda Stock Exchange. Uh, we also have Umeme in our market, um, which again is doing extremely well. Uh, we had a cross-listing from London Atlas, but of course that had to wind up and uh, go back. But uh, we, we are increasingly seeing a lot of interest in our markets. Now, why, why are we focusing on this? Our whole uh, uh, goal, especially under the um, uh, Vision 2030, 
is to really, under the economic pillar, is to make position Kenya as an international financial center. So we are trying to make Nairobi attractive by bringing in players from other regions to list in our market. Uh, what that will do, it will focus the attention of the globe towards Kenya. So for instance, investors who want to invest in Rwanda uh, don't necessarily have to go to Rwanda to buy Bank of Kigali. They'll come to Nairobi. It's a deeper market. It's more liquid. Um, and with that, they will then be able to see other opportunities in Nairobi and maybe even in the future set up shop when we have the International Financial Center in place. So that is really how we will think we'll contribute more aggressively to the uh, NI NISC discussion, which I think is a big, big agenda. Number two, we want to position Nairobi as a really uh, a financial hub in Africa. Uh, in Eastern Central Africa, we are quite dominant. But now in Africa as well, we are getting our footing. Uh, one, uh, in this year alone, our index is up 6.6% uh, compared to our peers in the market. So we are ahead of Egypt, ahead of Tunisia, ahead of Morocco, um, even ahead of Nigeria. So again, that talks to a lot of things that we're doing. Uh, we've got a lot of incentives to attract international capital. We don't have capital gains tax in our market. Exchange controls in our country are not there. Um, we allow investors to, to own up to 100% of companies that are not strategic. Now, all these things cumulatively then bring uh, a lot of inflow. Now, when investors would come, would, uh, when, when foreign investors are coming to a country and they want to bring a foreign direct investment, how they test the country is through the stock market. So they buy a small holding, then they get their, their sites into research, they get their sites into companies. So if they're looking at energy sector, they'll buy a few stocks in the energy sector. If they're looking at the telecom sector, they'll buy a bit of few stocks in, in the telecom sector. And that gives them better insight on what's going on. And once they have that view, then FDI follows. So we believe that um, cross-listings are important. We have got various structures that we can do cross-listings with. We can have direct cross-listings. We can have dual listings. We can have global deposit receipts, which is just how you, you, you buy stock in another country and then uh, uh, create units in, a, in, in, the, in the country. You buy stock in the country of origin and then create units in, in the country that you want to operate in. And that allows you to trade even stocks that are not necessarily, um, not the actual stocks, but receipts on, on your market. Now, the structures exist, and we believe that with time, uh, people will appreciate this, and Kenya will be a deeper market and really compete um, for more capital coming into Africa. And that's really why we are we really supporting that, that drive. Clearly, there was, a, um, should I say, an anticipated uh, revision upwards in the dividend proposal. Uh, a number of us were surprised by it, the operating environment we are in, and uh, the uncertainties which are prevailing. Two, as I said earlier, if you look at the top line, it wasn't particularly strong. Don't you think you should have taken a more capital preservation standpoint as opposed to ensuring that shareholders get their return in, the, in this cycle? So we've, um, we've, 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 in the, we've always insisted on, um, or our dividend policy is, is about sustainable dividends over the years. So previously we were paying 40% of our net earnings. Uh, we've now pushed that to 60% 60, 60 and above, 60 to 80% of net earnings. Now why have we done that? So we've looked at our capital requirements into the next five years, we believe we have sufficient buffer on the balance sheet to cater for our future investments. Uh, we have now completed almost um, our entire um, uh, product development objectives. Um, we now have almost seven asset classes of, of global, internationally uh, uh, acceptable products. So we don't see ourselves going into heavy product development. We have, been, we have concluded the upgrade of our platform. We did that in 2019. We launched it in June. This platform, uh, the, the previous platform took us 13 years before we could change it. This one can take us possibly another 10 years. It's, it's really the most, uh, most uh, uh, available at the moment, running markets in Johannesburg and London. So it's really up to, um, it's, it's the most current version of this, of this product. Um, we have, um, so we've got infrastructure improvements. We've also done uh, a, a total change of our wide area network. So now we're using a new network provider, very, very stable, uh, who we consider has got stronger uh, level of availability and connectivity. So infrastructure improvements are complete, product developments are complete. We have uh, repositioned the exchange, we have profiled ourselves better, we are members of WFE. All that was heavy capital outlay. We have restructured, uh, I spent close to 52 million shillings in 2019 on restructuring alone. So we've done all capital outlay. So 
our investors have been patient. They've allowed us to do all this. And so we think it's time to, come to really reward them back. And so notwithstanding the fact that our top line came down, we felt that it was okay that we pay almost 70% of net earnings just as a way to reward it. And really, um, our, our, our view is that exchanges should be more rewarding because we are a cash business. Um, we don't necessarily have to um, invest into, 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 into other capital assets. Our, our core capital asset is the exchange system. So I can only promise our investors for better returns in the future. Uh, because now we've completed most of what we had planned to do. And that point by Jeff Odulo takes us to a short break. Business Redefined will be back with a lot more converse on this conversation on the capital market. Stay tuned. <music> Welcome back to Business Redefined. We're discussing capital markets and we're privileged to have none other than the Chief Executive Officer of the Nairobi Securities Exchange, Jeff Odundo. Welcome back on set. Thank you. Spent part one focusing on the results. Now let's talk about market development. Uh, it's going to two years ever since you rolled out the derivative segment. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, institutional investors have not warmed up to this segment as was expected because clearly they were expected to be the heavy lifters in this. How is the activity going? So when we started the development of this market, we had actually factored in uh, what we call the, the lead time for this product to take off. Uh, we were very certain that uh, the, early, the early entrance would be retail. Uh, why, why were we saying that? Now, derivatives contracts in their very nature um, are highly momentum products. So they trade uh, very actively. They, they, the values change and, and the value and settlement process is extremely fast. And so the institutional investors would probably consider this a bit too volatile for their uh, risk appetite. Uh, but one thing that we have, we've always communicated to them is that derivatives I've got two components. So there's the trading component, which is more of um, where the investors buy and sell actively, but there's also the hedging component. Now, the hedging component is what um, a pension fund, for instance, should be looking at. So if you have an exposure in a stock and um, the, you're really not certain whether the stock, of course, you've taken a view that it will rise, but definitely they are, the, the market moves up and down. So you need to protect your downside. Now, if you buy a sell contract, it does protect that downside because a sell contract appreciates with the price decline of, on the spot market. Now, that helps you uh, de-risk your portfolio because as opposed to your share price dropping, uh, your derivative value will, will be rising. So it will sort of give you a hedge to that. Now, that level of education is what you're trying to really, really drive onto institutional investors to look at it as a hedging product and not necessarily the fact that uh, it has high levels of volatility and hence a big risk to them. So that education is going on. A number of pension funds and institution investors um, are currently going through what they call changing their investment policy uh, statements because a lot of them had actually put uh, a restriction on derivatives. And all this is coming on the back of what happened in 2008 when you had the global financial crisis and uh, the derivatives were the biggest contributor to the to the, to the challenges we had during that time. But what people forget is that those derivatives were not trading on an exchange platform. They were trading on, on what you call the OTC market, over-the-counter market, which is not properly regulated. And hence, they could create layers and layers of derivatives on top of other derivatives. And, and in the process, when the whole um, um, market crashed, it had very serious systemic uh, impact on the whole market. So derivatives are very, very good products in that they help protect your, your, your exposure. And number two, they've also got, you can make money off it. It's a high momentum product. Uh, your values change every day uh, depending on what you see. So we are going through um, a very aggressive education with the institutional investors, but we are also focusing on getting our more retail investors in. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we should be launching um, one very big online broker onto the market which we believe will also be able to create more momentum and more excitement in this market. World over, derivatives are trading more value than actually spot markets. And we believe that's the direction we'll take. Uh, we are not utterly worried about it. We believe that we are in the right direction. It's just taking a bit of time. So um, we believe it's going to take off very well. But Jeff, let me play the devil's advocate here. You and I know that if you look at the asset allocation, there is increasing shift towards a fixed income, yeah. uh, which I believe is stealing the thunder from the equity side, and for understandable reasons. First of all, a majority of uh, the big pension players, I will tell you, I mean, we are risk averse. 
Yeah, so that explains why we are not playing in that space. The second thing is just that, I mean, we're in a very unpredictable environment. So in, in your medium to near, uh, near to medium term outlook on this uh, performance in the derivatives market, what's your expectation? Well, I think the, the fixed income allocation uh, is really, in my view, it's, it's a short-term tactical move um, where people are want to protect um, their, um, their capital. And it's not surprising. I think uh, in, 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 in terms of volatility, you don't want to take other options. You want to just play safe. Um, but in the long run, if you do your, your uh, computation of performance, you'll find over time other markets have appreciated. Let me give you an example. If you look at the uh, spot price of Safaricom early in, the, early in the year, I think it was trading at something close to maybe 28, 29 shillings. It hit a high of 40. Now, work that backwards as a return. Just work that, that component. It's way ahead of what you can get on your fixed income market not forgetting that there's dividends as well. So an investor should always, or rather a, um, a, a, an institution investor or a real investor should look at that value. Capital gains have more value than just waiting for the normal interest income. Um, and so we believe it's good to get fixed income uh, exposure, but it can't be 100%. It can't be 100%. Because don't forget, you're also faced with the challenges of inflation. So you lock money there for 18 years, uh, you're not forgetting that inflation can actually spike. And at the end of the day, your real return, uh, so if you say the return is 12%, inflation goes to 8%, your real return is just 4%. Whereas if you put money in a, in, in, in a stock and the price appreciates by 11 shillings, 11 over, say, 28, it's close to 30%, 40% return. So it's good to take a balance of, of that. But I, I do see this as a short-term measure. Um, everybody's shifting flight to safety, they call it. Um, but it's not always uh, a sustainable strategy. You really need to balance your portfolio. Balance your portfolio. Take exposure in, in equities, take exposure in, in, in bonds, take exposure in bank deposits, take exposure in derivatives. And you, you balance that. And I think in the long term, we see that seems to have a better performance as opposed to one asset class. Speaking about exposure and balancing portfolios, Jeff, if you look at the activity in the derivatives market, clearly it mirrors what happens in the spot market in the sense that uh, there's a lot of activity in the stock uh, futures as opposed to the index futures, clearly telling you investors want exposure in particular areas as opposed to the market as an aggregate. Do you think concentration risk is a big problem in this market? Concentration risk is a big problem. Uh, right now we have about 10 companies controlling 80% of trading volume and 80% of market cap. Um, it's not peculiar to Kenya. I can tell you in other markets, two companies control maybe almost 80-90% of the trading volume in those markets. So it's not peculiar. It's a common feature, especially in a, in a market where you have got a, a small number of listed companies. Uh, concentration risk is quite high. Um, we don't particularly think it's, it's not a good thing for us. It's not a good thing for the market. It creates a very big systemic risk because what happens when that one company that controls over 50% of the market cap uh, gets, in, gets into any crisis, then it drags down the whole market. So we believe that the market should grow. We need big-sized companies. We need, um, we need companies that have more, more liquidity, more float in the market to create depth. And that's what we, we want to achieve uh, as part of our, our, our strategy in the next five years. Because what we're looking at is to really make Kenya uh, an emerging market status market. And we have to get big-sized companies, the likes of Safaricom, and the banks to, to achieve that level. So right now, we have got a few companies with a huge concentration risk. Uh, however, uh, our only comfort is that the fundamentals of these companies are good. They're in growth sectors. Um, they, they, what I'd call market risk is not as high in, my, in our view because um, they're very dominant players in their respective sectors. So we do foresee it remaining okay, however, we are really working on rebalancing that liquidity or, or that exposure. Yeah. Speaking about new listings, uh, Jeff, we've had a long conversation. And I think I just want to get a status update as far as conversations, perhaps with the privatization commission. How far are they? And uh, what sort of pipeline are we looking at, at least in the medium term? Thank you. So um, as part of our strategy 2020-2024, um, the, our, our agenda one is sustainable growth. Sustainable growth of our products, of the market, of 
all things equity market. And, and what does that mean? We want to double this market cap. We've been at, two, at 2.5, um, 25 billion US dollars or 2.5 trillion for a long time. We need to get to four and, and, uh, and, and moving forward. So the big listings will come from the state corporations. And we believe that government can exercise this opportunity and really help, um, help uh, fund its budget programs using the market. They have done that in the past. I mean, we, between 2006 and 2008, the government raised a huge amount of capital, well in excess of 200 million, billion shillings, to fund various programs. And they were very successful. And that uh, catalytic effect is what will encourage private corporates to come to the market. So where we are today, we are engaging with government, we are engaging with National Treasury and the Privatization Commission to really um, identify candidates that can be listed. Um, we have still in very, very heavy discussions. I, I believe you've also had the minister proclaim that uh, government is actually going to be looking at listings as a key agenda for them. So we can only hope that um, the conversation is, is getting there. Um, right now, we, we can't share where we are on each of those candidates. All I can say is that uh, we are optimistic something is going to happen soon. Uh, but that's not really our only focus. We are focusing also on private corporates. Uh, Kenya has a huge number of private corporates that have yet to access the market. Uh, we were doing just a rundown yesterday of the companies that we can talk to. We have almost 80 good companies today that just need to bring 10, 15, 20 percent of their of their float into this market, and we are we are up to uh, five trillion and above, 50 percent of GDP, which is our target. So we have a two-prong strategy: government and private sector corporate, large corporate. We believe that um, something is going to open up. Um, the fundamentals are great, and we're just looking for. Uh, it's been a long journey. I know this question has come many times. I'm also hoping to plug that conversation at some point. Hopefully this year we'll see one company come through and, and, and really the journey begins. Jeff, two quick riders there. First is that um, when you talk about the private companies, majority of them will tell you, why not go to the private equity space where there is ample hand-holding? I don't have to make all the disclosures that come with listing. And Let's be honest, Jeff. Between 2013 and, 2014 and 2018, we saw the rally of PE activity in this market. It tells you something. Because a lot of these companies, uh, the transaction with Java, with Art Cafe, whatever it is, why don't they come to the market? Um, I appreciate PE and the, and, the, and, the, and the value they brought to the market. They do, they do come in as, um, as a, the first capital to, to, and more easy access cap capital initially before people look at public markets. So I appreciate they have a role to play. But they need to hand over that role at some point. Now, the reason why I think there's a complementary role here, when a private equity com company comes into a business, they have got a very defined time horizon. So they'll say, because uh, those funds have got uh, certain limits. You know, they say five years, seven years, that they have to exit. But the, the most seamless way should be exiting through public markets to then give the original founders of that business, a longer stay or a longer, um, uh, to bring on board a longer investor who can then continue with them through their journey. What's happening is that um, in five years, uh, this company wants to make an exit. Um, they, they then say we are all exiting, including the founding, the founding uh, investors. And so the business model has then changed or the vision changes from the longer vision of why I founded my business to this short-term return, let's make a return now, sell this business at these many multiples, and all of us, let's get out. You get it? Because the dictates of, of a business, if you're selling the business, um, the person buying can say, I want to take 100% control. So if you want my money, all of you must go. Yeah. But if you could exit your component as a private equity through the market and leave the founders to continue with their journey, then you'll be achieving to you will be achieving a, a, a great, um, I even think it's, it's, it's even a way of, of, of really helping the founders uh, continue with their belief. I've, I've talked to a number of founders who today are saying the experience has not been as exciting because they're all being forced to exit the, exit the company they founded because a new buyer is coming in. But if we work closely with the PE firms, then they can exit their component. The multiples in our market are equally attractive. Uh, we are paying, I mean, over 10, 10 times um, uh, multiples at the moment. Yeah. 
which I think is quite competitive. So they have, they have a role to play, I do believe. But again, we can provide that exit channel for them and allowing the market then to complement each other. And that, that's a conversation we're saying. Uh, the second thing is that we have also created what you call the unquoted securities platform. So you don't necessarily have to come to the stock market today immediately. You can go to a platform where you are, you're, not, you're not required to uh, comply with all those listed obligations that, all, that, that, that you have to do when you get into, a, into, a, into the listed space. You can remain uh, unlisted and still access this capital on that platform and have a bit of more trading in, in your shares. So we have created all the opportunities. I think it's just about the discussions we should be having with each of them. Skeptics of state corporations coming into the market to divest a stake will tell you that uh, if you look at the history, it doesn't look too rosy. You look at Uchumi, you look at Mumias, you look at KQ. Out of every five you could count, uh, you have two success stories, Safaricom and KCB and the likes. Do you think that uh, that history then creates an impediment, even in terms of should they then divest, the appetite will not be as large as we expect it to be? Well, um, <clears throat> we've seen, and, and really, um, I think the experience you're speaking about is really normal for, for companies on that, the companies that come to the market. They're those that uh, will be able to um, achieve great success, uh, get, old, get on to get, get great value and growth. There are those who face certain challenges. And it's not, it's not uh, unique to them that the fact that state corporation, you're a state corporation, then you're going through this. What um, has affected these companies is not the fact that they are listed. It's the fact that probably the sector they operate in has gone through fundamental changes, uh, certain strains in their business, um, um, global impact on their businesses. So the other factors, other than the fact that they're listed, in any case, I think listing gave them better governance, better disclosure. You're able to know what's going on in Chumi than knowing what's going on in these private supermarkets. Okay? And probably that's why Chumi is still, is still in the market. I mean, they're still making their disclosures, meeting their obligations, uh, keeping their books, doing their accounts, annual accounts, publishing them, difficult as they are. Uh, and so, with a new capital injection, ideally, the company will then turn around. So I think the listing benefits are not just the fact that um, the value of the share is eroded or the, 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 there are serious financial issues, but also what it does to governance, what it does to brand building, what it does to um, uh, wealth creation and all that kind of thing. So challenges are there. Uh, I think the benefits outweigh the challenges that we have seen. Uh, some, some of these companies like Safaricom today is a great success because they came to the public markets. I believe if they not come to the public markets, they would not have had uh, this level of growth, this level of appreciation. Uh, Kenja, for instance, as well. KCB today. Because what happens? You open yourself to a wider audience of, of investors globally. All right? And there's great value creation through that way. Um, so challenges will remain. Uh, more, it's more external to the market. It's more of the business fundamentals and their own structures as opposed to being a listed company. I think listing actually helps you comply more yes. and make more disclosures. So it's not, a, it's not really a, a risk. There's a lot of concern out here around what a potential delisting by KQ could mean and why that is critical, Jeff, is this. Uh, this could materially happen at a time when uh, parliamentary sessions have been suspended because of understandable reasons. Um, does this bother you? Yes. Um, KQ was uh, one of our biggest companies in the market. I remember it was my first investment, personally, uh, in the stock market. That's how I got my first taste of the market in '96, And uh, was a very high performer, um, a great, great member of our indexes, and, and really good volume. And a large number of Kenyans have invested heavily in KQ. It is sad that um, we are possibly facing an, an exit through the nationalization process. Um, and really, uh, our only wish is that um, whatever structure it takes, even in the longer term, if it comes part of a holdings company, then that holding company can then be listed on the exchange. Because we believe that um, there's still great value that it can add uh, as a national airline. Um, if they get a great bailout and, and, and they're able to turn around uh, the process, then I think there'll still be great benefit for the, for the country. And so, Given the challenges they face today, it might be inevitable for, for them to get um, 
for them to get other options. But I believe ultimately when they do get a, a solution, uh, they should also just have a journey back to the market because we believe that um, governance is highly enhanced through a listing process. So our only hope is that they'll come through a structure. Um, if it's the, going to be the aviation holdings company, um, then that company will then be listed and, and Kenyans will then get a chance to invest again back into the airline industry uh, through another structure. Last year we saw the listing of Homeboys Entertainment and uh, my view and many others has thought that uh, the timing was indeed inauspicious and indeed the first corporate action they, de they gave was to issue a corporate warning. And uh, the concern is that perhaps in the hunger for listings then we are moving in haste with some of these companies. What's your assessment, Jeff? <clears throat> so, um, we are not hungry for listings. We have a very clear focus on getting quality listings. Now, Homeboys uh, was a member of our Booker program, and hence they went through the whole journey of um, corporatization, and they did that very well. And so they were ready as at last year. Now, <clears throat> their decision to list to come through last year was really informed by what they view as, as an ideal opportunity for them, uh, given that they are cre creating preparatory ground of considering doing an IPO this year. And so even in their disclosures, the 2020 financials were actually disclosed. And, and clearly, um, they are, as of September, their projections looked quite that uh, they, they, this was going to happen, though they were still sure that they could try and ramp up the performance towards the last quarter. And so it's not utterly surprising. Um, and I think they've done a good thing to, to take, be very bold and come out and say, this is how we've performed, this is a profit warning, and now we're looking forward to a better year. So um, it's not the desire to get more listings. It's about getting more quality listings. I'm very happy with that company. It's our first company on Imbuka to convert. They are, they are, they are really improving their structures. They are they're out there. They are, they're, they're thinking of how can they also educate the public to look at look at their company and, 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 and even build the market. So they're working on a greater scope. Um, and so I would not say that um, uh, 2020 was a difficult year for everybody. And so I think it's not a, uh, an, an issue of quality. It's a good quality company and we expect to see better performance. Uh, and we gave them that approval on the premise of good projections into the future and they were able to demonstrate that. Speaking about the Booker program, Taskies was a member of the is a member of the Ibuka program, and of course uh, we all understand the headwinds they've run into. And it, not only was it a member of the Ibuka program, it was in the accelerator category, which is really top tier. Uh, do you think the headwinds they've run into then create a reputational risk for the whole program? Um, uh, the question is very is very nice, and I really appreciate the fact that um, these companies are willing to face a challenge, and they're willing to come into the program um, with, good, with good desires. And at some point, unfortunately, they are faced with such problems. Um, we, the reason why we set Ibuka up was to strengthen companies and to help them uh, corporatize and, and, and come up well. Tuskies was one of our prime candidates and uh, we had a great discussion with them. Um, these challenges were not foreseen. Uh, we actually very good projections of listing Tuskies fairly fast. Um, I think the, the challenges they ran into um, were really not desired, and uh, I believe it was a bit unfortunate. Uh, having said that, um, I think the company has still committed to turn around. Uh, they've not given us a final decision. They're very confident they can be able to, to come back to the market. Um, and so, at least for now, they have, uh, we, we, we are still keeping them on. Uh, but we've given them options that uh, should they feel the challenge is too, is too difficult to overcome, they are voluntary listing op delisting options, um, and, and that's, that option is open to them. Um, now, we, we, we have taken a book as a learning. Uh, we'll never always get it right. Um, these companies are coming into the market space for a first time. They're, they're, it's unfortunate that some of them are falling, <coughs> falling apart too soon. Uh, but there's that desire for them to survive, and, they want, and that's the reason why they come on board. Our current candidates are going through very rigorous um, corporate, corporatization training uh, to, to a point that they never imagined, because now they're being asked to disclose this, disclose that, understand their balance sheet, 
Um, what are these factors? Deliver your balance sheet if they're non-core assets. Do you necessarily need them? So that whole transformation is, is something that takes a bit of time and, and they're, they're, they're driving that process. So Ibuka is still a great platform. Uh, you're going to see great results, I can assure you. Uh, of course, some of these have been unprecedented. And uh, where, where we face such challenges we, and they, they can't be overcome, we tell the client to consider taking a suspension voluntarily. Um, and if, if, if they feel that they can't, then we make some hard decisions. Yeah, but um, we, are, we are really on, on that journey. And you'll see more and more coming. We've, um, there's just one we're supposed to list today, and uh, we're just hoping that they'll, they'll succeed as well. And uh, you'll see more and more coming on board. Security is lending and borrowing. Um, how much of a game changer is this? And why I ask that is because I'm imagining if I'm a pension fund sitting on long-term uh, positioning and I have uh, sh shares of company X, I want to take a position which I think will work in the short term, but I still have to have a long-term game in mind. How is the warm-up to this? How is the activity around it? How is it unfolding? So our SLB framework um, currently is uh, in a sandbox, in other words, a pilot stage um, with the CDSC. As you know, the CDSC are really the ones who are going to drive that, that process because they're going to be sort of the, the, the clearing house for this particular uh, framework. So they've put in place um, a whole process of how um, SLB agents will be able to undertake the process of getting the borrower and the lender together and ensuring the whole lending and borrowing contraction is done well and transfer of securities and transfer of of collaterals are managed. So that, all that is being put in place. Now, this is a game changer for our market. If you look at the current uh, trading, vo the, tr the level, the, the, the holdings that trade and the holdings that don't trade, it's almost 25-75 exposure. 25% is what is trading, 75% is what co investors are holding long. Now, these investors who are holding long are not earning anything other than dividend and probably capital movement value which is really a paper profit together. There is good rationale. Every fund manager should ask himself that question. Why can't I lend this stock? Why can't I earn interest on this stock? Don't forget, it's collateralized. So somebody will say, give me uh, X percent of a, of a share and, and, and I'm giving you a deposit of so much. Okay? And you lend that stock to me, I go and trade with it and I buy it back for you. You're still entitled to the dividends, what they call economic dividends. You're entitled to the bonuses, all that is your, is, your, is your return. And on top of that, you're getting interest on, 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 on for the period I'm holding. So it makes good sense for somebody with a long position to lend. Now, what does it do? If we can double the level of liquidity in the market from the current 20% of total holdings to 40% of total holdings, then that level of activity will push our trading, trading turnover which is currently at 7.5% of, of market cap, to 15% of market cap. You can see the kind of velocity we'll have, the kind of trading, the kind of liquidity we'll have. Uh, because some investors are not able to come into this market because they don't have the right ticket size. I mean, one investor wants to put a minimum of what? $5 million on one stock, one day, one day's trade. He can't get that stock. That's half a billion, you know, <laughs> you know over, over, over holdings. Why? Because we've all locked them up. Uh, waiting, for, waiting for dividends that come once a year. Why don't we lend that stock to the market, let the market trade on it. You're still in, it's still your stock. Uh, there will always be the return and all that. So it is a definite game changer. That coupled up with day trading, which is also something we're working on, uh, is going to take this market to the next level. And so we believe liquidity, we're going to unlock that liquidity through the security lending and also have day trading to also help have more and more uh, turnover done on the market on a single day. So those two are great opportunities. We've seen a lot of development around um, stockbrokers, mergers, a number of them exiting. And the question is, uh, is stock brokerage dead? Or what's really the, the, the outlook for this space of the market? Granted, we understand the operating environment has been extremely tough and the volumes are really thin. What's your expectation? Well, I think... Um, this is a great industry. Uh, it's really how do you remodel your business on an ongoing basis. Um, I think stockbrokers need to diversify. You can't necessarily have trading as your core business and remain there. You need to think of other parts of it. I mean, we have created very many opportunities in the capital markets, very many different licenses. If you want to be a nominated advisor, 
you can become a nomad. You can also as assist in advisory work. Um, you can create, you can convert into an investment bank and then do transaction advisory as well. Um, and wealth management and all these kind of things. So I think there's great, there's, it's really a remodeling thinking that needs to happen so that you don't remain skewed to one particular sect, uh, uh, service. Uh, because you're exposed to the volatility. I mean, if something happens and trading goes down, then you also swing with it. But if you had other products like wealth management, which is a great sector, um, I look at the wealth management sector and the way it's growing, even globally, it's becoming a great opportunity that you need, to, you need to take advantage of. So the direction should be diversify the business now and look at how you can make trading just part of a, of a bigger bouquet of, 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 of offerings that you can give to the market. Um, it does make sense that uh, inevitably uh, having big firms in the market is good. So mergers would be a great, a great discussion. Would like to see more and more of them come together if they've got synergies because it does create buffer your capital. It provides you with a bigger market, a bigger network, bigger strength to explore the market. So mergers would be great um, as opposed to totally exiting the market. I know a few players are exiting, but it doesn't speak to anything in our view. It probably speaks to their own uh, views about their returns and the fact that they have not met certain expectations. But opportunities of mergers. You can see banks are coming into this space. They're acquiring brokerage firms. They are going into them. So I think it's really how you model the business that, that should speak to that as opposed to returning the license, which at the end of the day, um, I think I still, I still personally feel that the market has a lot, a lot, in the, a lot to offer for the future. All right, I still have about five more questions, but Mark and Dom is on my case that we need to wrap up this conversation. That takes us to the close of Business Redefined, the conversation on capital markets with the Chief Executive Officer of the Nairobi Securities Exchange, Mr. Geoffrey Dundo. Thank you so much for your time. Up next is a markets report.